Graham Show with me, Chris Goodrum. As per usual, a big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show, liked, commented, all that kind of stuff. Please, please keep it up. Um, I know there's some comments I haven't actually uh, replied to as yet, so I will do so as soon as possible. Um, I thought last week's episode of the show was a bit of fun. Uh, I always look forward now to the uh, uh, the Whiskey Heroes releases after the, the, the first lot. I mean, like I said, the, the labels are just so, so cool. Um, and it's nice to see that, you know, the, the juice in the bottle, as they say, is reflective of the... Um, uh, of the artwork on the label so that's all really really nice had a, uh, a nice email from Brave New Spirits uh, to say you know they were happy with the review which is which is makes everybody feel pretty good you know everybody's a happy bunny and you know um, it's all, all marvellous isn't it all wonderful <laughs> um, anyway, on to <laughs> not to say this week's episode show is going to be any different. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, Claxons will be happy with the, with the, the end review. Uh, and as you see, I'm looking at uh, some new releases from Claxons and a couple of older ones as well. Um, my relationship with Claxons goes back pretty much to you know when they first started. Um, I remember um, Adrian Hoos giving me a, a call one day and just you know sort of asking for some advice and some information and all that kind of stuff you now so you know uh, and I imagine that he spoke to a number of other people as well so I like to think that I had a, a, a small part to play in the uh, the foundations of, of Claxons and as you know we've we've stopped Claxons and uh, done stuff together over the years so um, I don't really need to go into sort of too much detail apart from just to say a big thank you to uh, Claxons for the samples for today's episode of the show your continued support is very, very much appreciated, as is everybody's, uh, you know, that has uh, sent in samples over the years. So anyway, uh, if it wasn't for, for those companies, those distilleries, and you guys that are watching, there'd be no episode of the show, and I'd be sat here talking to myself. Mm, maybe I am. Anyway, not going to go there. Anyway, let's just take a look at today's lineup, shall we? Right, so um, some interesting bottlings in, in this week's lineup. Some stuff that I haven't come across for quite a while, and that includes the first one. This is a, a, a Tobermory. Oh, yes, one of my favourite distilleries. Um, so this is uh, from the warehouse, oh, they're all from the warehouse number one uh, range. This is the Series 8 Tobermory. It's a 13 year old, um, distilled in December of 2010, bottled this year. Uh, a first fill rum barrel number 62a uh, and that was bottled at 50.5 percent as you know i've done an episode of the show a while oh, several years ago now on on how i thought that sort of uh, uh, to tobermory had changed to uh, change their sort of uh, their style um you know going back to around about sort of uh, 2007, 2008, I think it was when I think they basically started taking narrower cuts and producing a cleaner spirit. Um, and I obviously, as you well know, had the uh, the, the new and older samples, and um, that was that was my that, that that was my conclusion from from the tasting. Difficult to say about the Tobermory uh, spirit itself because they use far too much bloody um, brand new oak and first fill oak. Um, but it certainly seemed from certainly the Leche a lot cleaner than what it used to be. Uh, bottling number two is a Manic Moor. This is a um, quite an old bottling, quite a 34 year old Manic Moor. <laughs> a bit of a jump there. And it's actually quite nice to see an independent bottling company bottling something with a bit of age. I'm getting kind of well used to seeing sort of independent bottlings all being below 12 years old really um, and it's kind of yeah okay so obviously a 34 year old whiskey is going to be <laughs> expensive I mean all whiskey these days is expensive but it's nice to see uh, something with a bit of age so um, yeah 34 year old Manic Moor uh, distilled in February 1990 bottled this year uh, from series 8 uh, bottled at 44.7 bourbon barrel C24114 hallelujah <laughs> an old bourbon matured whiskey i mean you know as i've said on several occasions that the whole independent sector has simply become obsessed with finishing and all that kind of stuff so and i think a lot of them have kind of got away from the kind of um the belief that sometimes you know it's just good to leave a whiskey in a bourbon barrel and have lots of well hopefully lots of distillery character and old american oak character at the end of it rather than uh, mucking about with various wine cast finishes and talking of finishes um anyway uh, we're on to a, a 26 year old space uh so this is uh, from series seven 
of the warehouse number one range distilled in October of 1998 bottled this year at 53.8 percent and this was finished in a refill Oloroso octave uh, C24109 now the hairs on the back of my neck always kind of start to stand up when I when I come across a, an old whiskey that's been finished in something or other because it kind of like says well why did you finish it was the original cask not giving you enough character um, that it needed some some more oak character um, has it been compromised who knows of course obviously we'll only find out when we actually taste it um, bottling number four uh, is a leche um, so nice to, to, to do do a couple of Tobin Warries um, a few years ago I wouldn't have said that um, so yes this is a 12 year old leche uh, bottled of 53.2 percent uh, refill uh, no Oloroso Octave I think probably a finish I would guess uh, C24111 bottled, distilled in September of 2011 bottled this year from series 7 uh, and then the penultimate bottling is a Kalila from series 8 this is a 10 year old Kalila uh, from an STR Hogshead number C24115 distilled in May of 2013 bottled this year at 58.3% and the last bottling is uh, from the series eight the campbelltown blend um so an eight year old uh <laughs> bourbon hoggy thank god for that i mean i'm getting really quite mm, no i'm disappointed i think is the word with the campbelltown lock and the fact that the initial bottlings were wonderfully american oak aged uh, spirits and now it's all bloody sherry um, yeah, I know a lot of people are probably wetting themselves over the, all, all of that, but for me, anyway, this is what I w want to see, the, the Campbelltown blend. Um, so it's an eight-year-old, uh, distilled in March of 2016, bottled this year at 51.8%, and like I said, Bourbon Hogshead C24116. I'm guessing uh, it was probably pre-blended and then put into cask, I imagine, um, rather than being blended by um by uh Claxons themselves so really looking forward to this lineup i think it's got some interesting stuff so let's kick off with a bit of tote more <laughs> okay so let's kick off with the 13 year old tote more let's see what the nose gives on this then shall we right well straight off the bat clean um there's there's no dirtiness there's no cardboard it's a little spirity, I will say. Um, it's got some barley, vanilla. The rum cast notes are there in the background. They're quite subtle. Uh, there's a nice fragrant, rummy, dried fruit, apricot, sultana. A little herbal note, some salt as well. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's not a bad nose. Um, it's giving me a bit of distillery character I guess and, and it is showing that the distillery character is nice and clean and that is um, the biggest thing to take away from this so that's right okay so it kicks off with the, the rum cast and it kind of fin com continues with the rum cask and continues with the rum cask not ple pleasant um, it's clean again no sort of off notes no dirtiness no cardboard um, it's all pretty rummy and dried fruit there's some salt um, a little bit of spice it's quite masked on the finish the alcohol is kind of making my mouth water I'm not getting a great deal of distillery character at all uh, on the palate let's see if Putting a little drop of water will just tame that uh, rum cask character. Let's see what the nose gives. Actually, no, it's done completely the opposite on the nose. I'm getting a lot more of the rum cask now, and, and, and practically no, uh, no sort of saltiness, no uh, barley. I mean, it's not again, it's not unpleasant, but it's just now become a little bit more simplistic, a little bit more cask orientated. That's all the parts I know. Yeah, again, it's pleasant, it's okay, it's become a little bit sort of more simplistic, 
um, sort of soft, juicy, rummy fruits. Um, again, not a lot of character other than the cask, although, like I said, the spirit is wonderfully clean, it has to be said. So, although it's not a bottling that I would absolutely kind of rave about, I think it goes to sort of show that sort of Tobermory, um, as a distillery, is certainly in, in, in a good place at the moment. Okay, so let's move on to the 34-year-old Manic Moor. Let's see what the nose gives us on this. Oh, that's a lovely nose. I mean, I don't get to I don't get to taste very much old whiskey these days. There's just not a lot of it floating about. Certainly not in the independence. Um, and this is lovely, lovely old, mature, sawdusty oak, um, sweet oak, vanilla, gooseberry, lime touch of grilled nuts, some almond paste, um, a little bit of wood smoke. Okay, I'm going to say there's not a great deal of Manic Moor character, but then what is Manic Moor's character? It's a, again, sort of light spay really, isn't it? Um, and we are talking primarily oxidation and oak, um, but bloody good. I mean, I love this sort of stuff. I mean, you know, really really peels i mean i mean and to be fair like i said there's a little bit of gooseberry a little bit of citrus you know it's not sort of a total homogenous nose um but it's got some beautiful maturity it has to be said so that's on. Again, that's a pleasant palate. Um, and herein lies the rub with this particular bottling. It's a retailing for, you know, almost £200, and it's pleasant. I mean, it's not kind of like, you know, stirring the loins, shall we say. I mean, it's got a lovely maturity. Again, it's got some mature sawdusty oak, a little bit of lime, some gooseberry, sweet and sour gooseberry, almond, vanilla, but there's not a great deal of complexity happening here. I mean, this is... And this is partly about because of Manic Moor is not exactly a very complex spirit to start off with. You know, it is a pleasant spirit. It's it's kind of, you know, classically spay. Um, but it just doesn't have the sort of the wow factor of a, a near £200 bottle of, of whiskey at the end of the day. Um, and that's what I'm looking for, you know. I mean, and, and, and maybe I'm being a bit too critical on this. But you know what, you know, if I'm on the other side of the coin and I'm splashing out, um, oh, the counter I should say, not coin, uh, and I'm splashing out £200 on a bottle of whiskey, I want that to be the most incredible, mind-blowing, sort of loin-tingling um, whiskey that I've had in my life. And unfortunately, that uh, isn't it, I'm afraid. Right, okay, so let's move on to the 26 year old Speyside series number 7, 26 year old uh, and refill Oloroso octave finish. Okay, I, 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 I kind of quite like this nose, okay, it's kind of, now I am getting some American oak, I'm getting some old American oak, some dusty American oak and then shooting through is this younger raisinated sherry fruit, it's kind of, I mean you know, we all remember sort of older bottlings of, of Speyside and the heavy sherry influence and all that kind of stuff. And now how now they've kind of moved away from that to a certain extent. So, you know, I kind of like this. It's kind of a sort of, you know, harking back to an older style of Speyside, but also, you know, keeping in mind the slightly more modern style that the distillery is uh, showcasing. There's a little bit of Turkish delight, some gooseberry, some lime. There's a lovely freshness, a vibrancy of, of citric notes. Um, a little bit of marmalade, some dusty spice. Mmm, that gorgeous dusty American oak. Uh, and it's balanced. This is it. I mean, I wouldn't have been had a problem with this just purely being aged in American oak. I think it's a gorgeous nose. Um, but the, the, the judicious use of the sherry quarter cask, or the sherry octave, sorry, it's just kind of added a little bit of dried fruit uh, and it's not, and I don't think it's been done, like I said, because the original cask was shagged, basically. I think that, that this has been obviously done deliberately and it works. It's lovely. Let's see what the parts are. Like. 
Okay, we do kick off with more of the sherry to start off with. It's got that kind of old armagnac sort of dried fruit, dark dried fruits. Um, as the, the American oak comes, comes through on the mid palate, I'm getting the sawdust, a little bit of barley, some mature fruit, um, nuts, um, spiced leather, tobacco. As the sort of the sherry starts to return on the, on the finish, lovely progression, really impressive. Lovely vibrancy. Um, don't think it really needs any water. I just love, I mean, it is 53%, but that sort of, out, the alcohol is just kind of aiding the vibrancy of, of the palate and just keeping the, the, the sherry sweetness at bay and, you know, maintaining the balance. Um, does it emphasise the sherry a little bit on the nose um, when I put some water with it? And it's certainly not as kind of complex. I didn't, like I said, I didn't really think it needed it, but I'm just kind of, yeah, some people sort of, yeah, will find that sort of vibrancy on the palate a little bit too much. Um, so I hope I'm always looking at these things to sort of like from a consumer point of view to see whether they take water well or not. Finish is a little dry, but again, it's got a lovely weight of fruit, a little bit more sherry orientated now with the water. It's kind of brought that forward. Um, it's still pretty juicy. It's still got some lovely complexity. I'm still getting some American oak notes, although not as much as they were when it was neat and it's not quite so vibrant now, but then I was expecting that by just knocking down the alcohol. It's certainly a lovely contemplative whiskey, and I think it's in about a similar kind of price point to the... Um, uh, the Manic Moor, I would have that without a shadow of a doubt over the Manic Moor. That is frankly bloody good. Right, okay, so let's move on to the Oloroso Octave finished, matured, possibly don't know which uh, Lecce. Look at the colour of that. I mean, <laughs> that is that is a dark old sherry colour. Um, so let's see what the nose gives us. Clean. Um, wonderfully clean. I mean, and this was, you know, I it was not a case of I hated Tobermory. I hated the what I hated was the fact the spirit wasn't very clean. I mean, I love Lecce. I love the meatiness, the sort of like the the savoury character of Lecce, and it was just always marred by this kind of wet cardboard note. And but this, mm, none of it, none of it. It's got all that wonderful meaty, savoury Tobermory character, herbal peat, intense tarry dried sherry fruit um do you know what there's an, even a kind of a little bit of kind of almost kind of musar like um volatile black fruit as well black currant cherry mm, i mean that's 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 a kind of a, a manly malt as they say not not that i'm being sexist at all but i mean that is meaty and oh you know it kind of it doesn't rip your head off, but it's kind of it's this is this is lecce. This is how it should be, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And how many times have you heard me use those three, four words in the same sentence? You know, I mean, you know, it, my, I'm going to have to sort of reconsider the axis of evil here, and maybe Tobermory are, are kind of finally going to move out of the axis of evil. Ooh. Anyway, let's see what the power's like. drier peat still slightly meaty more oloroso dried fruit more tar um, a little medicinal note on the mid palate some salt um, vanilla coffee a little bit of dark chocolate a little bit of dark toffee um, quite nice quite again sherry influence throughout raisinated fruit on the finish clean wonderfully clean I mean you know if if, if, if Tobe Mori keep this up, then, well, you know, I, I'm going to have to basically say, well, the past is um, the past, as they say. And, uh, you know, <laughs> considering, I, again, another bottling of Tobe Mori, uh, you know, Lecce, that I'd quite happily sell to you guys. Maybe not quite so much the, the um, uh, Tobe Mori from the, the, the first sample of the, the afternoon. But even so, I mean, that was just wonderfully clean. Um, and, well, hats off to them. Um, Okay, more sherry now, less meatiness, less savouriness. Um, 
It's got a sort of an almost kind of marmalade -y kind of character, a dark marmalade, um, dark blood orange marmalade possibly, vanilla, a little bit sort of softer, a little bit more smokier, less meaty, still really nice nose it has to be said. So all the parts like that. Softer, tamer, and I don't mean that in a derogatory manner. I mean, you know, I love the wild, savoury character of it. And eat. It's a lot more softer, it's a lot more sort of easy to live with, I suppose, now. Once you put a little bit of water with it, it's a little bit more sherry. There's still some nice smokiness there. Um, but really, really, you know, neat. That, that's the way to go with that. Okay, let's move on to the Kalila. So this is 10 years old. STR cask. Let's see what the, the nose gives on this. Or STR hoggy, I should say. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> right, okay, so let's move on to the 10 year old Kalila. So STR hogshead. Let's see what the nose gives on this then, shall we? Ooh, that's. Ooh, that's, that's a gorgeously fruity Kalila. Um, apples, pear, Peach, yeah, a bit of peach. Um, whiny red fruits, juicy, fruity. Wow, wow, that's 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 a sort of side of curly that you don't really see that often. I mean, I you know, I'd never. I mean, yes, unpeated curly, and there's not a lot of peat on this. It has to be said. This is practically unpeated. It's almost tropical. I mean. I can't think of a, another bottling of Kalila that I've had that's that's all, that this tropical in character. Yes, it can have that sort of white fruits and sort of citrus and that kind of thing, but you know, estuary tropical. Where did that come from? And it can only be the sort of the, the cask. I mean, <laughs> you know, and it kind of like again, it kind of feeds into this whole concept of distilleries. I mean, I know Kalila sell pretty much buckets of their stuff. You know, it's not like kind of. Mm, that's a bit of an iffy cast. We need to get shot of that. Um, I mean, they sell it by the, by the bucketful, really. But uh, it, again, it kind of feeds into this kind of narrative that sort of you know this is an unusual uh, Kalila and oh bloody good. I mean, that's lovely. Um, mm, let's see what that's like. Wow, wow, I mean tropical, almost rummy, um, banana, lime, apricot, very little peat, there's a smidge right on the finish, some whiny red fruits kind of coming through, a little bit of tannin, a little bit of coffee, um, practically no peat bar a little bit on the finish, I mean that is juicy and fruity and that is kind of, but the thing is again, you know, if you're looking for a, a, a kind of a fairly peated Kalila, you wouldn't know that, and that this is the thing, isn't it? At the end of the day, you sort of with Kalila, you have such a variety of of of, of peating levels within their, their spirit that you don't know what you're going to get. Certainly not with the the independence. I mean, yes, there is an an unpeated, or well, there used to be an unpeated um, Kalila bottling. Whether they still do it or not, I have absolutely no idea. Um, and at least in that instance, you you kind of knew what you were getting, but. Um, Oh my god, I mean that's that's lovely. I mean that is absolutely lovely. Um, don't think it needs any water in reality. I mean although it is 58.3%, mm, oh dangerous one there. Um too many of those and you're not gonna be uh, standing up. Um Okay, so when you put a little drop of water with it, I'm getting a lot more of the STR cask, um a lot more of the red wine fruits, that kind of thing, a little bit of tannin, um less less fruity less tropical um a lot less fun i can tell you that for a start um so yeah there's a oh, soapiness a little soapy note there i didn't remember picking that one up when i uh, tasted this the first time but anyway i'm going to stop sniffing it now because when you start to pick up on a note you're often going to get kind of channeled into it um but anyway let's see what the pants are Again, quite sweet, quite fruity, quite tropical. Um, 
no peat at all now. Um, that's that's completely disappeared. That little itty bit of peat smoke has kind of completely gone. Really fruity, really tropical. Um, mm, that's a lovely palette, either neat or or with water. Personally, I would go for it neat. I, I think that's got a little bit more intensity. Um, but either way, I mean, stunning Kalila. Really. <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the last bottle of the afternoon. So this is a Series 8 Campbelltown blend. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Mmm, yeah. That has Campbelltown absolutely stamped all over it. Really malty, slightly funky. Possibly a little bit more of the Glen Scotia than the Springbank. Um, there's some earthy barley, vanilla, toffee. Um... Yeah, there's a youthfulness there. The spirit is quite young, obviously, but it has a vibrancy. Um, there's a little bit of rose petal. It's starting to become a little bit more honeyed, a little bit more fishier, a little bit more fuller. Um, I think possibly the spring bank is starting to come through a little bit. Now, a little bit more when you leave it in the glass. Um, mm, a little bit of green fruit there. Got a slight note of gooseberry, which is unusual. Um, and herein lies the rub, you know, it, when sort of Springbank started releasing, the, or re-releasing the, the, the new Campbelltown malt, uh, the Campbelltown um, lock, sorry, um, it was American oak, and you picked up all the nuances, all the different, different components, and then suddenly, what, three bottlings into it, hmm, big old bloody sherry, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, a, a kind of, a pastiche of the of the Springbank 15 year old and it's kind of yeah th this is where it's at this is stunningly good I mean if you bought the first couple of bottlings of of the the Campbelltown lot buy this I mean all right it's not cheap I know but yeah 60 something I think um oh yeah this is this is the the, the dog's doodars shall we say of uh, um Campbelltown blends um spot on let's see what the power's like Mmm, lovely. Quite sweet fruit actually to start off with. A little bit of funkiness, a little bit of fishiness, sweet, malt, juicy, chewy. Again, I'm getting possibly a little bit more of the Glen Scotia than the Springbank, but I still think that's a gorgeous blend. Um, sweet barley, a little bit of tannin, a little bit of toffee, gorgeous length. I mean, that's... 51.8 again I don't really think that needs water it's got a lovely vibrancy it's got the freshness which kind of stops it, the sweetness and it is pretty sweet I mean I don't recall um, a Campbelltown whiskey that with this kind of level of sweetness that hadn't been a finished in a Saturn's cask or a rum cask or something like that um, mm, it's absolutely lovely oh, I tell you what I mean that has made beautifully aromatic. A little drop of water has really brung this to life. Or brung this to life. That's really crap English, isn't it? Brought it to life. Um, summer fruits, I mean, although we're, we're now oh, technically in winter, aren't we? I mean, with the clocks going back. Um, dusty vanilla has got more age than it really should have. Um, all I can say is if Claxton's, we've got a few more of these cars squirreled away. Good, good for them. This is bloody good. Let's show the pass on. Mmm, sweet fruit, juicy, almost, almost verging on the tropical. Very un-Campbelltown, as we said. And there's probably a lot of people going, well, it's not dirty enough for me. Well, mmm. Bloody hell, I don't want that dirtiness, to be frank with you. I mean, I'd much rather have this sort of lovely, juicy, fruity monster of a whiskey um, than some kind of, you know, dirty, funky kind of, you know, you, you get where I'm going with this. That, that is a gorgeous Campbelltown blend. Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show. Firstly, a big thank you to Claxton's for uh, the samples for today's episode of the show. Very, very much appreciated. 
Um, some of these bottlings you may well have seen, or may well see, or have seen, or oh fuck's sake. Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show. Firstly, a big, big thank you to Claxton's for this week's uh, uh, samples. Um, that's very, very much appreciated. Some of these bottlings will have appear on, or probably are appearing, or have appeared, or on, <laughs> on the shelf of a certain uh, a whiskey merchant. Um, the Tobamori, um, yeah, okay, so good, clean spirit, but just a bit too much rum cast, from my personal opinion. Uh, or personal taste, as the case may be. Um, the Manic Moor, 34-year-old, a lovely old whiskey, um, just not enough complexity to warrant the uh, the price tag. Um, the Space Side, yeah, I mean, you know, you look at it on paper, you think, hmm, old whiskey finished in sort of a sherry cask. Why? Why? Because it actually worked really nicely. It was judicious. It added that little bit of sherry character. It didn't really need it, I don't think. But they did it, and it worked, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, moving on, the Lecce, like I said, sort of like modern era Lecce. Um, some consumers will probably never have had old Lecce, which <laughs> you're not missing anything. Um, that is Lecce as it should be, nice and meaty, and sort of like, you know, full, and mm, yeah, really like that. Um, the Kalila in the SDR cast, like I said, um, Really tropical Kalila, practically unpeated. I mean, there was maybe a little bit of a whiff of peat there, um, but really fruity. And I can't remember the last time I came across that Kalila was that fruity. And finally, the Campbelltown blend. I mean, that was absolutely gorgeous. Like I said, sort of harks back to the sort of like the first couple of releases that the distillery did in the camp, the new Campbelltown lock, and absolutely gorgeous. I don't think it was quite made up of all of the spirits from um, the Campbelltown region. I think it was primarily um, Glen Scotia and Kalila, but even so, that was gorgeous, really nice. So, um, so yeah, if any of these bottlings have taken your fancy, then feel free to look them up online. And like I said, if you're uh, local to, uh, to Nottingham, then um, yeah, some of these will, like I said. Anyway, that's which episode of the show in the bag. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, until next week, all I have to say is good afternoon and good running.